All right, we have a brilliant interview for you guys today. Uh, living it legend. hasn't happened yet, so we yeah, well, you're be... right. It might suck. Yes, <laughs> but at least the person <laughs> I'm interviewing is brilliant. Uh, living legend Norman Lear joins us. Uh, if you don't know, uh, you better ask somebody. But obviously, uh, the person behind All in the Family, Sanford and Son, Maud, the Jeffersons, and not only that, but also people for the American way. So. Uh, Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. That's right. Can't let that go. No, you can't. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about your book. Um, even this, I get the experience. Uh, it's about your whole life, which is perfect because in these interviews we ask you about your whole life. So here to, here to talk about that whole life, right? And uh, you know, like when the by the way, uh -huh. I've spent every second of that life. It's now ninety-two. Will be ninety-three in July. Years. But every second of that time I spent to be here with you now. Oh, wow. Okay. Can you view it once you think of it any other way? It and whatever the hell you've done here. in your young years, is every bit of it has added up to this moment. But for me, that's literally true because uh, I, I couldn't get to interview someone like you unless I'd worked my way up. And and you know gone through all that hard work to be able to get someone like you to come in and, and sit down and have a conversation so I could learn from you. Yeah. So I, I I agree with you completely. Now the yeah. other way around, your the whole life leading up to talking to me, I don't know about that. Yeah, that <laughs> you give a damn is something I've worked all my life for. That's just true. to be asked to sit here. All right, I like that beginning. Yeah, okay. It's the way it is. <laughs> you were, and you all were destined to watch it. Your lives led up to this moment where you watch this interview. Yeah. So, <laughs> but now they are so many people. Mm -hmm. We're just a couple of people sitting here. So they, you, all of you, have spent your entire lives, every second of it, just to get here to listen to this old fart. <laughs> and uh, I'm way ahead because they add up to more than I add up to. Well, that's true. <laughs> so now, do you think it's fair to say that uh, when conservatives talk about uh, liberal Hollywood, that you are part of what they're referring to? Well, I am certainly what they're referring to, but I don't consider myself liberal Hollywood. I consider myself a bleeding heart conservative. Fascinating. Why is that? Because you will not mess. If this was young, a lot of younger people, I'd say you will not fuck with my First Amendment, <laughs> my Bill of Rights. My uh, Constitution, my Declaration, you, the promises my country made to me and everybody else here and elsewhere. Uh, and I think there's no more conservative point of view. Where the bleeding heart uh, comes in is will I move over? Will I, do I understand that there are a lot of people who are born, unfortunately, without the opportunity to grow? in healthy lives and productive lives because things are unfair, because we have not yet given what we promised, equal opportunity, fairness under law. Uh, we're, we're, we incrementally are supposedly gaining on that every year. Uh, I don't want to wake up in the morning. I'm not hopeful that will happen. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, but it hasn't, mm -hmm. and so that's where the bleeding heart comes in. Uh, don't worry, I, I got your back. We're we're gonna get fight for equality of opportunity. We're gonna fight for free and fair elections, and we're gonna win. Uh, now uh, let's let's go all the way back because look, these shows that you produced, uh, so many of us grew up with, including me. You know, moving including on. Including me. Up, yeah, moving on up to the Upper East Side. <laughs> it's uh, it's what I grew up to, right? Mm -hmm. And. So the Jefferson's dream was my dream, <laughs> and these fam these shows were uh, you know it's called All in the Family, but we were all the family, right? right. It was our family, and uh, these are iconic American cultural uh, moments and shows. So, let's. But you didn't start out that way. Uh, you you weren't born wealthy. You weren't the son of a uh, Hollywood producer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's talk about how you got there. So, uh, what conditions were you born in, under? Uh, who were who were your parents? Well, I was a kid of the Depression. My father had several brothers. They were all pretty much belly up. Uh, the uh, the uh, 
greatest compliment, when I was a kid, the greatest compliment paid to an adult male was he's a good provider. A guy that was making a living for his family, mm -hmm. a good provider, that was the term. Those words are still magic to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't remember wishing to be anything else but a good provider. Now, in my experience, a good provider was my Uncle Jack, who was the only guy who ever flicked me a quarter. I thought it was so great to be able to flick a quarter to a nephew. He was a press agent, so that's what I wanted to be. I uh, wanted to be Uncle Jack because I wanted to flick a quarter to a nephew. Huh. That was, and I, I didn't have parents who asked me what I wanted to be or seemed to give a damn. Uh, so that was it for me, a good provider. Your parents, uh, I read, are the basis for the parents, Archie Bunker and... Well, and my father, there was, uh, there was Archie Bunker and him, yeah. He used to call me the laziest white kid he ever met. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> I would say you'd have to put down a whole race of people to call me lazy, and he'd say, that's not what I'm doing, and you're the dumbest white kid I ever met. I, I start the book, even this I get to experience, uh, saying if I could have, I, I always thought if I could have turned a screw in my father's head a sixteenth of an inch one way or the other, he might have known right from wrong. Mm -hmm. That's just about verbatim, the first line of the book. And that was the controlling element in my youth. So how do you grow up progressive in an environment like that? How do you know? Did you have a mentor? Uh, did you, were you born thinking, wait a minute, now I, I, I think maybe all the races are the same anyway. <laughs> like how did you come to, to well, those conclusions? Well, I was, uh, my father went to prison when I was nine years old. Uh, trying to sell some fake bonds. And uh, I had three years and a little bit more living with an uncle and uncle and uncle, and finally my grandparents. And, uh, but when my father, shortly after my father went away, I was playing around with a crystal set we had made together. That's a little radio and a cat's whisker and a crystal and earphones. And I caught a signal and it was Father Coughlin, who was a famous anti-Semitic, anti-New Deal, pro-Hitler. Uh, I mean, this is long before Hitler came to major power, but he caught the wave. And, uh, and I learned in that, when my father was away alone, it seemed to me, my mother and my sister were living, I don't know where, I, I, di I didn't see them. And uh, so I learned at that moment that there were people who hated me because I was born to Jewish parents, you know? I was a Jew. And I, this is a long way to answer your question, I appreciate that. Uh, but it was, a, it was a stunning piece of information. But I do remember having civics classes in school in those years. We don't have civics in our educational system in public schools today, despite all the patriotic bullshit. We don't have civics. But uh, we had, when I was a kid, and I was in love already with those guarantees and promises and so forth. And I felt I, these laws and rules and, and uh, you know, were there to protect me. Oh, As a matter sense. of fact, yeah. when I was graduating from high school, I entered a, uh, the, the, it was the first American Legion oratorical contest. And we had to pick a subject. Mine was the Constitution and me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought maybe as the member of a minority that those promises might have meant of the Declaration, the Independent, you know, the uh, Bill of Rights, might have meant just a little bit more to me than it meant to somebody who didn't need it as much. Mm -hmm. uh, that was my first awareness, but it was real early, and my appreciation of that grew from there. 
So then later you're going to college and you drop out of college to uh, go to World War II, yeah. uh, join the military, go to Let's World War II. See, that, I, I look at that as a really straight line uh -huh. from learning what this, what America meant to, I got a, won a scholarship my first year, the only year at college with that, uh, in that uh, American Legion debate. And then, uh, of course, I was going to enlist. Because you love the country because and this is the country that protects you and you're going to protect the country. Yes. I mean, the, the, I like to think of it this way. Uh, when all this was going on in my life in those years, we were in love with the American idea. We were in love with America. Mm -hmm. I don't question anybody's patriotism today, but they love their country. But in love was, for me, in those years that led up to World War II, that saw us finally win that war. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was impossible to conceive of us winning the war when you look back and reflect on how little pre prepared we were for it and what we had to do to get there and finally to win it. And then we were the good people and decent people and reflective people who uh, came up with the Marshall Plan and uh, helped Europe get back on its feet. I mean, we were good guys. Mm -hmm. But I think we took ourselves too seriously. And uh, we, were, we didn't lo lose our humanity and everything that was wrong with us as a result of being humans. You know, the nascent... Uh, greediness, power hungry, the, all those things that are part of us, you know, mm -hmm. that we either regret and neglect or we go with. You know? When you joined the, to fight uh, in World War II, I always wondered about this uh, because w w I didn't live it obviously, so I never knew how much information people had. At that point, did, did everybody know how the Germans were butchering the Jews, the gypsies, gays, poles, etc., or did we? Did you guys not really know, uh, A, that they were doing that, or the severity of which they were doing that? I don't think we, I, w I because I was paying attention for a reason I mentioned from age nine, uh, the word Holocaust didn't exist. I'm not talking about anything we learned, uh, you know, throughout, through the war and at, at war's end. But that they were, uh, that the Nazis were uh, far right fundamentalists, I mean, crazed people, we saw in their marching and their carrying on and Hitler's speeches. I mean, you know, it was a burlesque for us. Not that we were laughing at it, but uh, we knew they were bad. I mean, they were really bad guys. Mm -hmm. And we saw enough early footage. Fox movie tone news of buildings destroyed, artwork, you know, commanded or commandeered. Uh, we knew they were bad guys. But but did you know there was concentration camps? I don't think we knew at that time there were concentration camps. We knew that, I don't remember, maybe we knew that people were being herded together and something was happening. So, I mean, look, it had to... I learned, I, we it went overseas in the course of the war, I, I learned about concentration camps. Oh, okay, okay. And when you, ref, when, when, when we had won, and then you understood even more so the fight that we were in, not only for our lives, but for, against these historical yeah. monsters, right, and what they had done, I mean, I can't imagine that there would be a greater satisfaction in having won anything. Um, but I don't know because I've never been in war. I don't mm -hmm. know if that's how it feels. Did you have that satisfaction? Uh, what was your feeling coming out of the war? Oh, it was it was it was glorious. I mean, first of all, it was over. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> I didn't true have too, to worry right? about getting up some morning. Somebody might, you know. You you don't get used to being shot at. Mm -hmm. 
from the ground, from the air. You're, it's nothing you get used to. So. You flew combat missions. I right? flew 52 combat missions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I remember coming back with the guys that I went over with. We didn't fly every mission together. We were, you know, regrouped from time to time. But we flew most of them together, and we came back together. And it was common knowledge before we flew back that all the GIs were jumping, leaping out of the plane and kissing the earth. Mm -hmm. you know? And I remember we couldn't wait for the plane to land and jump down and kiss America, literally. I'm an immigrant. My parents uh, came here. I came here when I was eight, so I'm first generation. Uh -huh. uh, and from where? From Turkey. From Turkey. And uh, we had the same feeling you did for similar reasons, uh, although of course a little different in our context. But but we we loved America. We came here. We didn't. It wasn't an accident of fate that we were right. born here. We chose to come here. We and I was born and raised with the idea that America matters. That it's an idea. And it's an idea that you defend and that uh, that you believe in, right? So I don't like the present day cynicism about America. Now, on the other hand, it's our job to point out where we do right and where we do wrong. And unfortunately, we've done a lot of wrong lately. And it, you know what made us great was not just winning World War II, but just like you pointed out, the Marshall Plan, rebuilding our enemies setting up the United Nations, getting the world to work together. I mean, who is magnanimous and forward-thinking enough to rebuild their worst enemies into their top allies? I mean, it's, it's literally historic. It's well, one that, of the greatest that, achievements that, in, in mankind. That's us. By us, I mean we human beings who happen to be American, mm -hmm. uh, exercising that part of us that is noble, that part of us that is... Uh, transcendent. Yep. Now, we, we haven't done that without exercising the lust for power, gre our greediness, our selfishness. I mean, all of those things that are, you know, we're all born the same way. We have the same capacity to do evil as the next guy and the capacity to do the best as the next guy. And, uh, you know, I consider that we've taken ourselves too seriously. You know, we believed we were God's chosen. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and God doesn't choose as I understand God, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, my bumper sticker reads, just another version of you. Mm -hmm. And that's who I believe we are. Bless, I mean, uh, bless the fact that we were born in this country or you were able to get to this country. I was born here. Wonderful, but that doesn't make us better than the next guy from any other country. Because that leads to bad results. Once you start thinking you're exceptional, well, yes. then you come up with well, insane theories like American a, exceptionalism. That's where my head went when you <laughs> used the word. Right. And so now we think, well, that's okay. We can start wars because we're exceptional, right? Uh, we mean to do well as we bomb uh, your civilians and and start wars we never should have started, uh, and and so we got drunk with that power. Uh, I was going to say a little bit, but not really a little bit, a lot. A and lot. Uh, we got drunk on our idea that we were more moral than others, uh, which is ridiculous. We're all human beings, as you point out. So now, uh, as you s dropped out of college, dropped out of what you were doing, and the success you had to join the military, it. If it was today, would you join the military today or no? I would to to go to Afghanistan or Iraq or so. I don't know what I would. I wouldn't join the military. I would wish to find the best way I could to object. Uh, I, you know, on Memorial Day, I heard so many of. Uh, you know, members of the Congress or politicos or something with the flag pin. Uh, they, they wouldn't be American without the flag pin. <laughs> uh, and that's, you know, all you need is the flag pin and say, bless our men and women in uniform and all of that bullshit. Uh, but send them over there for nothing. 
and for less than nothing to be killed. Yeah. So now let's talk about your career. So you come back and my career. What about my career? Uh, so you wanted you wanted to be in PR because of Uncle Jack. Yeah. And so when you came to LA to be in PR, not not necessarily to. When to make I was shows. in Foggia, Italy, between missions, mm -hmm. I stood over in Foggia a, a, a linotype printer, a printer picking letter by letter. Spoke a little bit of a, a little Italian, <clears throat> and I sent out a sheet like that that announced, I sent, we printed a couple of dozen, I sent them to my Uncle Jack, who was still in publicity, to send out to uh, other publicity houses in New York and Los Angeles. Uh, and it was, it was a piece of paper announcing the ultimate, soon to be discharge of one Norman M. Lear who would, had the makings of a great press agent. And I remember making a big deal of, he doesn't want to be the guy, he wants to be the guy they, of whom they say, who's that with so-and-so? Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to be the person they know, so-and-so, he wants to be the guy with him. Ugh, remember that so clearly. <laughs> and, uh, and I had two responses. Jack sent out these letters. One was a job offer to this GI coming home from the war, and the other was an, a, uh, an offer to meet. Didn't hear from the rest. And uh, so my first job, I was married, by the way, uh, before I went overseas, and, uh, and I accepted the job offer. Mm -hmm. And so I was a press agent in New York immediately after the war, uh, and I was fired for being a good press agent. <laughs> oh, why? 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 It, that sounds so. By the way, that's also true today. Uh, most yeah. of the PR people I meet are in the business of suppressing publicity, not in the business uh -huh. of actually spreading publicity. I don't. They get it in their heads. They're like bad news leaks out, we're all fired. So don't. We want no news. Is that's my sense. Well, it was a different. Uh, you know, there are no newspapers mm -hmm. and there are no columnists. But in the years I'm talking about, there was, a, you know the name Walter Winchell, everybody seems yep. to know. Uh, but there was a Leonard Lyons and a Dorothy Kilgallen and uh, a Dalton somebody, and there were Louis Sobel, there were 15 major columnists. My job as a young press agent was to make up witticisms or sounds in the night, I remember Winchell used to use, for so that they would quote our clients, and my job was to get my our clients' names in the paper in the mm -hmm. columns. So there was a a major columnist named Dorothy Kilgallen on the New York Journal American, and uh, we had <laughs> we had uh, Kitty Carlisle and George Moss. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was a major playwright, she was a major actress. And uh, I wrote, they didn't know each other, but they were clients, and I wrote that uh, Kitty Carlisle gifted Moss Hart with a pocket flask measured to his hip while he napped. So somebody must have said, what the hell is this bullshit, Dorothy, mm -hmm. to kill Gowan. And, uh, she called my boss, George Ross, and wanted to be fired. Wait, I don't get it. Why? What, so what was Because wrong with it was that? silly. I mean, uh -huh. measured to his hip while he napped. And, uh -huh. and, I mean, it was just, but that's why he said it was too good. Uh -huh. <laughs> it was a good line. Uh -huh. um, George docked me. I was getting $40 a week. He took me down to 35 mm -hmm. And I, I, I stayed with him. She happened to print another item that I wrote. This is when I was fired. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I was, uh, we had another client called, it was a, a Broadway review called Are You With It? It had components, sketches and music and so forth. And one of the acts in the show was Buster Shaver and his midgets. 
at four midgets. The lead one, that's the way it was worded. <laughs> yeah, I know. The lead midget was uh, Olive. So I wrote and Dorothy Kilgallen printed Buster Shaver and Olive, seen shopping Fifth Avenue. He on foot, she on a St. Bernard. Now that's plainly silly. Uh, but I thought funny and interesting. Uh -huh. I could believe it if I could believe a lot of other things that were going on at that time. Anyway, I was fired. <laughs> <laughs> so then I went to California. You see, but that's PR. The, that's done right. You, I mean, did you get them publicity? You got yeah, them publicity. I got them publicity. <laughs> right. So you come to LA. How do you get into the uh, uh, TV business? Uh, a cousin here who was married to a fellow who had come to California to be a writer, a comedy writer. Mm -hmm. And uh, our wives one night were out for dinner. I mean, we're out to a movie. And we were taking care of, we each had a kid, little kid. And uh, we were taking care of the kids and he was, wanted to write a parody. We did it together. And they came home, you know, quarter after 10 or something. And I said, why don't we go out and see if we can sell it? Because there were a number of clubs, nightclubs. So we went out and within six, eight blocks, there was a place called the Bar of Music and a woman sitting at the piano telling jokes and doing bits and pieces. And we sold it for $40, which was a big number in my head because that's the most I had ever made. In a week, right. Yeah, in a week. Uh, and uh, we started to write together. That's how we began. So just going a couple of blocks down the street, selling it, and then finding the next guy and somehow getting into to TV guys. Okay, so that's how you begin, and you start working yeah. your way up. But to sell a show like All in the Family, that's a big, big deal. H how did that happen? Uh, how did that happen? I was doing very well. I'd done work for uh, the Dean Martin, Sherry Lewis, Colgate Comedy Hour. Ed Simmons and I wrote. We wrote The Martha Ray Show. Uh, we wrote the George Goebel show. We, so we were established writers. Uh, but I wanted to do a situation comedy because I had a friend who had done one earlier, one of the earliest one called I Married Joan, about the star was Joan Davis, who was a major comedian at the time. And uh, we were both being divorced. He had several kids. I had one kid at the time. He had no trouble with his divorce. I was going nuts, being driven crazy. She wanted everything. His wife only wanted his Joan Davis rerun. <laughs> uh -huh. So I said, I've got to do a situation comedy. <laughs> because so the reruns like, were so Because you, you know, you own something. Right. You know, you actually own something. Live television, you own nothing. So we were very well paid, but we own nothing. So when I read about this British show, Till Death Do Us Part, it was called, about a father and son who argued about uh, things political, and I thought about my dad and me, how did I never think about that? So that's how it came about. So how controversial was it at the time? You know, we are on page 121 now. Of, of the book. Even this, I get to experience. I want to be very careful I don't tell every fucking story. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try, try to get I this. want you to read the book. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll speed up in a minute. And but no matter what I do here anyway, it's a better read. I, I hear you. Uh, or I also, I did my own uh, uh, reading of the book for uh, cassette, for DVD. All right, so everybody get that. Even this, I get the experience. Right. So uh, at the, t I I'm not sure that Archie uh, that All in the Family could be on the air today, because uh, it was it was very controversial. Um, I mean, yeah. I look back at some of the episodes and I go, wow, they got to say that on TV, especially back then. Yeah. So how controversial was it? Did it cause problems? Was it an issue on whether it was allowed to be it on never, air? Never. You know, the only places that it caused problems was where people were thinking for other people. 
you know, the program practice is a euphemism in television uh, for censor, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, that department where somebody was reading a script and was interpreting for his boss what that boss thought should be on, to, you know, on, on CBS, let's say, who in turn had a, was answering to somebody north of him and there were five steps to get to the top. So these were people who were not even exercising their own opinions. They were trying to outthink the guy they worked for or the woman they worked for. Well, it was all guys mm -hmm. uh, they worked for. So uh, to understand that is to understand if you give in to it where you think seriously, wait a minute, I know American families. I know what they're talking about. I know what their problems are. There's nothing I'm saying here that you couldn't hear in a schoolyard uh, anywhere in the country. And they didn't want you to do it. You know, it didn't take a lot of strength to fight it. Mm -hmm. So do you think a show like that could be on the air now? I feel like the right wing would say, how dare you? This is, you know, it... it it's, you know, stereotypes of what people uh, think, and it's outrageous. I just, I don't feel like well, they got people who are showrunners who are currently involved in television tell me uh, they agree with you. They don't think it could be on today. Uh, I, I'm not in the business, so I don't know, but uh, but that's what I hear. It's hard for me to believe because I think if, I mean, and I do see things that are, you know. I mean, South Park is, you know, strongly political. That's true. And, that's true. Uh, and, and, and that's, I guess, maybe a difference between cable and network. And I maybe the networks are a little, still a little bit yeah. more skittish. Well, I guess, I guess you can do a little more with, with uh, uh, animation anyway. Yeah, they don't that's seem true. like real <laughs> characters. Yeah, right. But they're very real if you're paying attention. What, what, what do you think is, how do you, how do you view the state of television now? Do, do you like I it? I think it's the golden age. I think this glorious. But it's, it, television isn't three networks anymore. Mm -hmm. It's all the streaming and all of the other language. And, you know, uh, I don't understand the business well enough to make sense of it. But I know there are a lot of great shows to watch. What's your, uh, uh, outside of your own, what's your favorite sitcom? Maybe South Park, maybe Family Guy. I love Seth MacFarlane's work. Wow, okay. I, I think uh, The Book of Mormon on Broadway, which is the, the guys who do South Park, Trey right. Parker, Matt Stone, is uh, the greatest gift of sanity we have today. <laughs> uh, here, here. Uh, how about favorite drama on television ever? Well, I don't know, ever, there's so many. How do you, you can't I mean, stop, you can't not think of The Sopranos. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't not think of The Wire. My God. Uh, today, uh, what is Jill Soloway doing? What's her show? The Trans Transparent. Mm -hmm. Have you seen Transparent? No, I haven't. Oh. It's fabulous. Uh, this is the guy who's you know, 58 years old or something, coming out to his children, grown children, mm -hmm. uh, after knowing since he's five years old that he should have been a girl. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's brilliant, just brilliant. Okay, yeah, no, I, uh, I'm right there with you. Sopranos, The Wire, uh, certainly yeah. top five, not top two. I, right. I hear, you know, practically every day, what do you mean you're not watching uh, Enterprise or is that the show? Uh, or uh, Blackish or uh, The Veep or uh -huh. you know, all the time. In 1985, you wound up selling your company. Uh, was it to Columbia? To, uh, we sold the company to Coca Cola. That's interesting. They sold it to Columbia. Okay, so what what was the company at the time? Was it all the the rights to the TV shows that you had produced? It was the rights. It was all of the shows, and and uh, we had some television stations and uh, some motion picture theaters. Mm -hmm. It was a big. Con 
and Coke of bought company. it. That's fascinating. The Coca-Cola company bought it, yeah. Huh, okay. And so it seems weird to us that a brand would buy it now, but I guess uh, in the way that now brands are producing content, maybe it does make sense. You know, it's big. Or maybe they had nothing in mind except uh, to resell it later, which is what they did. Right. So at that point, uh, you now, uh, let's just be honest, you're, uh, you're comfortable. Let's call it what it is. You're wealthy. It's right? not hard to be honest about right. that. Right. <laughs> okay. And... A, do you feel like, oh, I made it? It's, you know, you're a good provider. Do you feel like a great I sense of accomplishment? You, I, oh, God, you remind me of something I, I, have, I think of every once in a while. I got up one morning after years of flying cross country, and I used to get up and go to the airport a half hour earlier to take out $10,000 worth of flight insurance. There was a desk or a machine, depending on the airport, where you could take out an extra $10,000. I woke up one morning and thought, I don't have to do that. I'm covered. Oh, right, right. That's, that's the first moment I put the two, the phrase together for me. Mm -hmm. Son of a bitch, I'm a good provider. I don't <laughs> have to get that, that insurance now. That's great. Um, after that, um, there's more. Even this, I get to. <laughs> so, did you feel like, <laughs> looking back on it, was it the right decision? Uh, did you did you think like, well, good, I was a good provider, I had a sense of accomplishment, and then from then on, I could do what I wanted, uh, or did you have any regrets? Like, oh, I wish I'd have held on to it because I'd have done different things with it. To the extent that I have regrets, it's just exactly the way you said. Oh, I wish I. You know, two more years, but that fast, that flip, that unimportant. Uh, sitting here, I said this when I was married to my wife. I had three grown daughters at the time who were sitting there also. Uh, when I met the wife, the woman I'm married to now, some 28 years ago. And I heard myself say, and I could say again, I don't, I don't regret, I'd like to applaud and, and, and bless every person I ever had any contact with or every moment that led to this. Because if I can feel great in this moment, I can't regret anything that got me here. That's exactly the way I feel sitting here. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Now, you, then you shifted from um, doing day-to-day -day TV shows to doing a lot more uh, political uh, things, like People for the American Way, an amazing well, that came that came out of a deep concern, going back to the very beginning, mm -hmm. of the misuse of religion uh, and the mixture of politics and religion, because my country said we will not do that. Mm -hmm. You know, there will be a wall of separation between religion and politics. And wherever we see the mischief of politics and religion, we see trouble. Mm -hmm. So when Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson and uh, that group started to proliferate across television, I was initially amused. And I thought, oh, there's a good, there's a good film there. I'll do a film about this. Mm -hmm. and savage of what I was seeing, the way Paddy Chievsky, uh took on network, took on television. Uh, but then I saw one of them ask his congregation to video congregation to pray for the, he went like this, removal of a Supreme Court justice. And I thought, it'd take me three, four years to do a film. I got to do something before that. Hmm. So I made a TV spot in which a working guy, it was just a 60 second TV public service announcement, in which a working guy said that he and his wife and his kids argue about politics all the time around the kitchen table. And now there were ministers saying you were a good Christian or a bad Christian depending on your political point of view. 
And he's very confident his wife is a better Christian than he was. But the ministers and he agree on everything. Mm-hmm. So he wound up saying, there's got to be something wrong when anyone, even a preacher, tells you you are a good or a bad Christian, depending on your political point of view. That's not the American way. Mm-hmm. And uh, I took it to Father Hesburgh at Notre Dame because uh, I knew him and I showed it to him and he thought it was wonderful. And he gave me the names of some other mainline church leaders to visit. Uh, but he also said, uh, in addition to what my concerns, political concerns, I would find that mainline church leaders were uh, concerned about the way they, the way they misuse scripture. Mm-hmm. There was another word, not misuse, stronger than misuse, scripture. Mm-hmm. And I uh, could never forget Pervert. that. And in somebody's office, somebody said, I love that PSA. And at the end, when he says that's not the American way, you guys should be people for the American way. Mm-hmm. So that's how I didn't get up any morning and decide to start an organization. I did what I do, and it came as a result. So out of that PSA and out of that moment, you decided, I, no, we got to fight back in a more organized Yeah, I, I paid to put that on television in Washington mm-hmm. so that the Congress would be sure to see it. And uh, uh, there were only three, as I you know, remind you, three networks. And two of them had me on within 24 hours because it was so unusual and it was so you know, well received. Right. Now at that point, those guys are just getting started. But as it turns out, they grew and grew in power and pushed the country further and further right wing. Um, what do you think went wrong? Why, why did they accumulate that much power? Because there were other elements in the culture uh, that knew how to use them. Mm-hmm. Uh, knew how to uh, fund them for their own purposes. The fundamentalist thinking uh, and the fundamentalist re- political thinking, fundamentalist religious thinking, and there's this uh, you know mesh of interests. They supported each other, and they continue to support each other, and. Uh, uh, general Eisenhower, who was my commanding general in World War II, and uh, two-time Republican president of these United States, you can't mention one time he was mentioned in the 2008 elections, 2012. I don't know before that. I haven't checked. And now... I know there were 103 people running for the Republican nomination now. <laughs> there was nobody mentioning Dwight David Eisenhower because as he left office, he warned us about the potential for the inv- too much influence of, a, of, of the uh, uh, military-industrial complex. The phrase was his invention. Mm-hmm. And in his first draft, he referred to it as the military industrial congressional complex. Yep, and there we sit now. And I believe that confluence of interests is what today has us by the throat. Yep. All right, well, I, I would love to delve into that more and your career more. We didn't get to the awards, we didn't get into more political thoughts, but uh, that's why you wrote the book. And that's, that's why, why I wrote the book. <laughs> Everybody check out Even This, Even I Get this. to Experience. So check out the audio cassette, the book itself, Norman Lear, literally a living legend. Thank you so Thank much for joining us much. on The Young Turks. Thank you. I know about the living, not sure about the legend. <laughs>